Yeah, she's a really in collaboration with the DC Startup League, uh, we are hosting a celebrity today, Mr. <laughs> Paul Brunson. And I'm proud to say that he is one of our board members. And uh, well, he is one of the most successful entrepreneurs I have ever met. Let me say the second one. The first <laughs> one is my boss, yeah, I know. Mr. Edmar <laughs> Yujan, who is the chair of our board. And this is the second one, so I always work with entrepreneurs. So you need people like me, right? Yeah, all, all entrepreneurs the need all the people like <laughs> me. Okay. Yeah, people who do the work. Yes, okay. yeah. <laughs> so it's a great pleasure to have uh, Paul with us today. And thank, I would like to thank him very much for allocating this time for us because he, had, he is a real celebrity in Europe now, in <laughs> London. And next time I would like to go to London with you to have some attention <laughs> to feel that kind of feeling. Yeah. How to travel with a celebrity like <laughs> Do you watch his show on TV? Yeah, it's, it's not in the States. No. It's not in the States, no, no, it's, not it's, not in it's coming, it's, it's Netflix next year. So. Oh, Netflix? Yeah. Yes. All right. Okay, so here is Paul Brunson. Thank you, Paul. It's a good-looking room. It's a good-looking room. It's a full room, which is, which is a blessing. So just to take a temperature check, everyone put your hands up. All right, give me your money. No. <laughs> no, no, all right, hands up. No, no, really, really, hands up. Yeah. Hands up. Okay, so now, if you have not yet started your business, your niche business, and you're here to get insight on how to start. You've not yet started, drop your hands. Okay, keep your hands up if not, okay. If you have, no, 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 be proud about it, be proud about it, there you go, hold it, be proud about it. Okay, so now, if you've already started, but you're within the first three years of your business and you're unsure if you found the right niche, you're unsure if you're doing it the right way, drop your hands. Okay. Uh, no, 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 if you're, uh, yeah, keep it up, keep it up, keep it up. All right, if you're within five years, right, you're within five years, you've already started the business, you already know that you're sure, but you're just here to get some good insight, drop your hands. All right, so now everyone, okay, so then the three people who still have their hands up, why the hell are you here? I'm just curious, why are you here? <laughs> for the breakfast and to see that. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 I, man, I love it. I keep it real, keep it real, keep it real. All right, why are you here, man? No. Oh. oh. I'm going to take all my attention right here. Okay, you get the presentation, this is it. Okay, so anyone else that still has their hands up? What up? I got to why are you here? <laughs> you don't cap that. Okay. This is your home, this is your home, we're in your home. Okay, all right, so this is good. So we all know kind of why we're here. Uh, we only have an hour, and for you that know me, or man, Jay knows me, you know that I'm long-winded. You know that I need an hour just for an introduction of myself. Yeah. So they were like, yeah. <laughs> so this is going to be a problem. So, so here's how we're gonna handle this problem. Okay? If you have a burning question, burning, it's burning a hole in your pocket, right? You can't even sit down, it's so burning, right? If you have that type of question, then just say, Paul, stop, I got a question for you, okay? But try to hold your question until the end. I'll try to speed through as quickly as possible, so that way we can get to the end and do Q&A. Also, I'm gonna be around afterwards for at least an hour answering as many questions as possible, cool? Cool. Cool? Cool, yeah. All right, sound good. Did everyone eat? Did you eat, young lady, in the back? Did you eat? Was the food good? Ready to listen to you. All right, cool, cool. All right, so here, here's where I want to begin. I want to begin by divulging something that you probably already know, is, you know, I was a nerd when nerds were not a cool thing. Yeah. Okay? Now, raise your hand if you consider yourself you were a nerd growing up. See, all right, let's have a nerd off real quick. Let's have a, because I see some hands. I don't believe it. I don't believe it. Undercover nerd. No, no, no. I, no. I don't believe it. None of my friends, yeah. I don't believe it. No problem. All right, let's, let's have a nerd off. I was okay. an undercover nerd. What was the nerdiest thing you did in high school? 
I was gonna say yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> I tripped over my feet. <laughs> okay. Oh, tripped over your feet. Yeah. Okay. All right. So that's, that's a, a, tripped over your feet. That's, that's good. Come on. Come on. Nerdy, nerdy. Explain, nerdy. nerdy. Explain, like. Okay. So here, here's here's what I did in high school. Okay, in high school. You're on the debate team. Debate team? No, no, no. It gets it gets worse than the debate team. I was on the audio visual team. Audio visual team. No, 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 no. The A B team still. I have you beat. I have you beat. So, oh, okay. in high school, my hobby in high school was writing business plans. <laughs> but no, no, no. There's icing on the cake. Yeah, she look. See, she's laughing at me. The one professor is already saying that's nerdy, right? Now, on top of writing business plans, I collected the Forbes magazine. Yeah, that's, Wait, not that's not nerdy. That's not nerdy. That's not nerdy. It's not. Now I collect. Who, who else collected Forbes magazine? Collected. My yeah. 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 Okay. So look. Okay. So we're we're in sync. Okay. So I collected Forbes. I collected Forbes. Now, you know what my favorite Forbes magazine of the year was? What was your favorite Forbes of the year? Uh, probably something with Donald Trump, Reagan, but. Oh, but was it? Was, <laughs> that's fair. Was there a particular theme that was your favorite? The list. The list. The list. Who said the list? Yeah, the list. Yeah, the the list. list. Which list was your favorite? The 500 richest. Oh, yeah. come on now. Yeah. 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 Or the most successful companies, but I like the richest people list. All right, so I'm in a room of nerds right there. Yeah. Yeah. All right, so we, we, nerds unite. So here's the thing. My favorite was that list. It came out in October. It was the Forbes 400. The richest. Americans, top richest Americans. But then a month later, you know what we got? The global. The global. There we go. The global list of the wealthiest people in the world. Oh my gosh, mind blow, orgasm. Sorry, it's early. But I was, I, I love this list. Okay, I love this list. Now, when I reflect back and I think about why I love this list, I realize something. It was the wealthiest people in the world. I love business. Business is about making money. So to me, this was like the championship list. These were the people who had made it. This was like the Super Bowl. This was like the US Open. This is Wimbledon. This was the top of the top, okay? I looked at this list and I loved it. And I became obsessed. I started reading everything I could about billionaires. Now this was back in the day. This was in the 90s. Y'all know about the 90s? <laughs> oh yeah. Some of y'all don't know about the 90s, I can see. <laughs> She's like, what? <laughs> the 90s? The night we didn't have the internet, no, okay? No. So all we had was that list. When the list came out, that's all we had. So I loved this list, devoured this list. I would read everything I could about billionaires. By the time I went to college, I knew every sort of detail of every billionaire there was in the world. By the time I left college, I wanted to be a billionaire. And just as fate would have it, I would go on to work for not one, but two billionaires. One is the gentleman that Sinem just mentioned who owns one of the largest educational holdings, period, right? Billions of dollars of assets. And this, his name is Enver Ugel. And the second, Oprah Winfrey. Oprah. That's right, that's right. Now, working for, by the way, it's Miss Winfrey if you're working yeah. for her, right? She'll correct you real quick, right? Or slap you in the mouth. Um, and then it's Mr. Ugel if you're working for him, not Enver as so many people like to call him. And working for these two people was extraordinary. It was extraordinary. Working for two billionaires? Raise your hand if you work for a billionaire. Right? Okay. Raise your hand if you work for two billionaires. Raise your hand if you work for three billionaires. Why are you not up here teaching it? You should be up here with me. I'm learning from you. Oh my goodness. All right. By the way, I love the flavor here. So now, working for these two billionaires, it was extraordinary. It's extraordinary to work for two billionaires. So I started journaling. Do you, did you journal? Yes. Writing down every detail that I saw. And I took all of that and I ended up writing a post. It was an article in Huffington Post originally called 20 Things I Learned Working for Two Billionaires. Raise your hand if you read that. That's wild. About a third of the room, maybe. That was the most viral, successful piece I've ever written 10 years ago. It's gone on to get me speaking engagements, etc. But what I did in that piece is I wrote down how you got Oprah Winfrey. Oprah! Right? Black woman here in the United States making her business in media. Then you have Enver Ujo, looks like a boxer, but he's charismatic, right? He makes his business in Turkey, he's Turkish, education. Completely different people, but yet same characteristics. It blew my mind. These billionaires have the same characteristics. So I wrote down everything I could. Now, this article 
was all the good stuff, right? Oh yeah, all the good stuff that I saw them do. But you know what I held back? The dark side. <laughs> the dark side. Now, Welcome to the see, she's like, what's the dark side? Ooh, all right. All right, I'll tell you. Okay. No. <laughs> so now, really what was the dark side? The dark side actually were two things in particular that completely turned me off from wanting to become a billionaire. Completely turned me off. The one is the level of risk that billionaires have to take every day in their life. I, I worked for Oprah during, not the everyone loves Oprah days. Mm -hmm. I worked for Oprah during the where's the own channel, mm -hmm. oh Oprah's career is done. You remember those yeah. days, yeah. right? Now, during that time, what a lot of people don't know is she had to put up all types of assets. Do you know that she had to put her name on the line? Literally, Oprah.com, Discovery, who owned the own network, 51%, she had to put her name on the line. That's the risk that she had to put on the line. Literally, her name, Oprah.com. Ember Ugel, I watched them build an empire, brick by brick by brick, not as long as with Sinem, but for quite some time, and I saw him risk enormously. And here's how I think about it. What is the biggest asset that you have? That you have? My family. Your, your uh, well, your physical rep, asset. Your rep, reputation. Your name. Physical. Oh. Your house. Who's that house? Oh. All right. So think. Oh. Think. All right. Think. Think about your own. All right. Think about your own. To me, the risk that billionaires take is every week you make a decision, and in that decision you can either lose your home where your family lives, or you can get another home. But you have to make that decision every week. It's, think about that. Think about that. You lose the home that your family lives in. That's deep. And it's not the risk, it's the stress that kills you. I didn't want that. Now, think about the time. One thing that I wrote in my article, right, and Sinem knows this great, it, definitely, right, is that Sinem and I, we've been with Mr. Ugel on the boat in the Asian Sea, right? We're chilling, playing backgammon in our bathing suits. I have a life preserver because I can't swim. <laughs> yes, Jamaicans can't swim. I tell you, it's crazy. It's crazy out here. We can't swim. I was so embarrassed. They're like, we're jumping in. Give me a life vest and I'll jump in. <laughs> Otherwise, I'm not jumping in, right? We've been out there, right? We've been out there, King of Jordan, going by on his yacht. Are we working out there? Yeah. Hell yeah, we're working. They just, billionaires just say, you know what, I'm just gonna take, I'm just gonna remove myself from my current situation, go to another situation and I'm still working. Every day they work. What I uh, realized, what I calculated is that I think billionaires work on average 128 hours a week. Wow. Now, how many hours are there in a week? Somebody quick, Google it. How many hours? A prize to whoever tells me. 168. 168. So if a billionaire is working 128 hours, what do they have left? Sleep. Sleep. That's it. And what's interesting is if you divide 40 by 7, you get 5.7. I only know because I did it right before I came in here. And you know what that is? That's actually the average number of hours that billionaires sleep. So that's it. That's all you get. You just get sleep. Sleep deprivation. And, and you get sleep deprived. I can't do that. I need time to watch Succession on HBO. <laughs> <laughs> or make your list. Or make my list. Or I need time to play chess with my boys. Or I need time to go on dates with my wife. Yes, married people do date. Yes. Yes. Amen on that. Right? Amen. You all know. Yes. So, so, you know, yes. right? So here's the thing. I said, this billionaire lifestyle is not for me. It's just not for me. But, Guess what? I love cash and checks. Who likes cash and checks? There you go, look at this. It's like, yes. Did anyone, I'm just curious, did anyone not raise your hand on love cash and checks? Because you're in the wrong spot. We're talking about cash and checks. We're talking about cashing big checks, okay? So I like cash and checks, right? But I didn't want all of the risk. And what's interesting is that that is what I believe led me down the path to becoming a niche entrepreneur, niche market entrepreneur, or what I want to coin is a phrase that I love, and that's not just niche, but micro niche 
entrepreneur. So real quick, someone tell me, what is a market? Let's just make sure we're all on the same page in terms of what is a niche market and what is a micro niche, because this is very important. What's a market? Who can tell me what a market is? Cars. I'm sorry? Cars. Cars, okay, cars is a market. What makes cars a market? There's a demand, it fills a need. There are what? There are buyers of a particular type of product, and there are sellers of a particular type of product. That's what a market is. So let's look at footwear. Footwear is a market. Why? People sell footwear, people buy footwear. All of us are in that market. Let me check your feet real quick. Real quick, let me make sure. Okay, I didn't smell anything funky, so I know we all have shoes on. All right, so now, yes, yes, I said that. Let me check your feet. You said I'm like, let me, what are you working with? Let me see what you're working with. All right, all right, I like it, I like it. All right, so that's footwear. Now, if we said niche market, that could be designer footwear, luxury footwear, right? That's niche market. But here's the problem that I have today, is that the niche market is so big, you could basically call it, a, everything is designer. Everything yeah. that we have on right now is designer footwear. So what I like to say is, and what I believe where the real money is, is if you can go as niche as humanly possible. Right. So what is as niche as totally, as humanly possible within the designer footwear market, niche market? For nurses. For nurses, okay. Crocs. So who said Crocs? Crocs, all right. Is Crocs a particular niche? Is it a micro niche? Absolutely, yeah. Yeah. it is. A matter of fact, it's interesting that you say Crocs, because just this morning, I saw that Yeezy. Yeah, those joints are ugly. Oh! <laughs> That's exactly what everybody said. Those joints are ugly. Everybody says this. All right, so Yeezy. Like yes. <laughs> Yeezy, Yeezy, my, right, the king, Kanye West, just announced the new phone. It's his new phone. It, come, it launches in 2020. It looked like Crocs, but they're $400 Crocs. Oh. Right? Right. And you know, Folks are gonna be wearing them. Yes, right. yes. Now I will be wearing my Crocs yes. and just maybe color them. Yes. <laughs> or cut holes in them. Or cut holes in them. Yeah. Right. But but he but think about it though. You say Crocs, that's brilliant. Yeezy, that's a niche. There are people who literally just buy and trade Yeezys. Right. This is a micro niche. Wow. For example, Crocs over here, nurses wear them and you know, it's right. something that you yes. wear at home, but whereas in Turkey Crocs are actually designed, they're like you know, Mr. Yuja would probably wear Crocs like going out. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah. absolutely. Especially if it's designed by somebody. Like Especially Crocs. if it's designed. Right. Yeah. There you go. No. Especially if it's designed, designed by yeah. Kanye West, right? He made yeah. dad's shoes cool. I mean, goodness gracious, right? right? So, so you've got the fact that you got this micro niche. Now, here's the reason why you can have a micro niche today and you couldn't have it back in the '90s when we were reading Forbes. It's one reason. The internet. Yeah. The internet. This trips me out. In the late 90s, do you know what percentage of the world was online? Just One, guess. Two. Ten percent. Yes. It was about seven and a half percent was online. Wow. Today. Today. What percentage of the world is online? Oh, oh that's that's everyone. Everyone. I mean, like 98. Okay, okay, okay. Wow, everyone's like 198. Paulo's shaking his head. They're shaking your head. What do you think it is, fellas? 60. Yeah. 60. Guess what? They're right. It's about, depending on who you ask, 56 to 60 percent. Oh, wow. Now, that is incredible. You know why that's incredible? Because in 30 years from now, do you know what they're projecting the number of people to be online from the globe? Eight. Nearly 100%. Do you see what I'm saying? Right now, if you are thinking about a niche market, this is the best time in the history of the world. It's just beginning. It's just popping right now. Right? Yeah. That's it, I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> but it is, it's just, it's just starting, right? Yeah. I love micro niches. I love micro niches. Now, 
Let me break down why and then let's get into how do you successfully launch, all right? Number one, why I love micro niches right now is you don't have the same level of risk and you don't have the same time commitment. You just don't. A matter of fact, if you strategically enter the market correctly, and we'll talk about that, what you'll find is that you actually spend less and less time working in your niche. Real talk, I work 30, 40 hours a week because I like to watch Succession, right? I like to watch documentaries, right? I like to do other things, right? But I'm working 34 hours, that's 10 years deep into the industry, and I'll talk about how I position myself. Another reason, less competition in micro niches. Wow. Yes, less competition. Now, here's the beauty. It's not just competition in volume, because think about it, if you're entering a new space or entering a small space, mm -hmm. there's not gonna be, you know, like in cars, there's not gonna be 500 competitors. You might have one, two, or three. Yeah. But then something else that I find interesting, the caliber of the competition is lower. Right, I went to business school down the street. There you go. <laughs> down the street, that's all I'll say, because we're in a school, so I say down the street. That's respect. That's respect. You respect the house that you're in. I was down the street, right? So down the street, I went to business school. When I got out of business school, everybody in my class, you know what they were doing? We're going to Wall Street, we're going to Silicon Valley, yeah. we're going to the C-suite, we're going to compete up here. And I said, I'm gonna be down here. <laughs> and this is not, like, this is not ego, this is real talk. I believe I've made more money than everybody in my business school class, all right? Because I went down where there's less competition. Wow. Less competition, everybody's fighting up here. Uh -huh. Come on down here. Yeah. Space, the water is warm down here. It's warm. So that's one, less competition. Number two, number two, or actually number three, because risk uh, and that, and then number two is the competition. Number three, very little regulation. As a business owner, when I think about regulation, I think expenses. I hate expenses, all right? So very little regulation. Number four, for all the money lovers in the room, Higher profitability. Yeah. Look at this. He's like, yeah. <laughs> higher profitability. Now, why is there higher profitability? This is a good economics question. I feel like I'm back in business school. Why is there higher profitability in a micro niche? Less suppliers. I'm sorry? Less suppliers. Less suppliers. There we go. Less suppliers. It's really basic, but it's a deep concept if you think about it. The more competition in a marketplace, the lower the profit margins. Think about burgers. It's crazy. I'm living in London most of the time. Every, on every corner, there's a freaking burger restaurant. Right? Shake Shack, Burger Lobster, no. McDonald's. Like, there's a burger. What are the margins on burgers? Terrible. Nothing. They make their money on fries or shakes. There's nothing in burgers. Why? Because everybody's serving you up, right? A heart attack between a bun. That's what, that's what they're doing. He's like, hey, 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 That's what I have for breakfast. What are you talking about? <laughs> yeah, I'm not judging. I'm not, hey, I like a good burger. Okay? I like a good burger. All right, so, so there's, so, so you have that. But then there's another business concept that I want us all to know. Have you ever heard about contestability? Ooh, I saw everyone taking notes. Paul's bringing out the big words now. Contestability. Contestability also drives down profit margins. What's contestability? Contestability is the likelihood of a competitor entering your market. So think about that. They don't even need to be in your market just the likelihood that competitors can come in will drive down your profit margins. Let me give you an example. Tesla, 2008, Elon Musk rolls out the Roadster. I loved it, I loved it, loved it. Couldn't afford it, but loved it, okay? He rolls out really the first sports electric, full electric car. There's no one else in the market sp space doing that. Everyone loves Tesla. Tesla goes public, stock goes up, everyone is in love. 
And then, guess what happens? Every manufacturer, every car manufacturer in the world, you know what they said? In the next five years, in the next two years, in the next 10 years, we're rolling out an electric car. What happens to Tesla? All the work they did. Literally. So somebody can copy this. Yeah. Why? Because it's the perception mm. of more suppliers. Mm. And that distorts the marketplace. Mm. So what you have to be thinking about as someone who's entering a niche market, a man, Jamaica in the house. Aww. Aww. Look at this. Look. <laughs> what you have to realize is that you have to protect against contestability. So when you're entering a niche market, if you can protect against contestability, you know you're gonna have higher profit margins. And then last but not least, what I love about a niche market or a micro niche market is that you just simply have more impact. You do. You are building something. Think about this. If you're in a micro niche, you're creating something that is unique. Yeah. This is what I'm saying. It's unique. And that uniqueness has social power. And that's what I love about micro niches. So let's get into how to identify your micro niche, and then I'll open it up for questions. How do we sit on time, by the way? We're great. <laughs> we're like, we're great. Keep it's going. A long time. We're good. Oh, okay. Keep going. Keep going. <laughs> no, yeah, well, how are we? 10 minutes. Oh, wow. this is perfect. Okay, all right, good, good, good. Okay. Let me get into how to enter, how to identify a micro niche how to enter, protect against the contestability, how to really strategically protect yourself in a micro niche, and then we'll open it up for questions. All right. Now, when I talk about these things, you may realize that the micro niche is not for you. And that's okay, because not everything is for you, as my mother would say, as I went for that game, <laughs> time and time again. Not everything is for you, son. Okay, number one, number one, and this is in order of priority, number one, is you must be able to identify a massive problem in the marketplace. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Let me underscore, massive problem. Massive. Massive. <laughs> massive. Massive. Yeah, you know <laughs> yeah, yeah, massive. Okay, now. <laughs> I'm sorry. This is what happens when you got into Jamaica. Just let me go back. Right. Just leave, man. Just leave. <laughs> okay. So now, what is massive? What is massive? Okay. Humongous. Humongous. Like ginormous. Ginormous. Like worldwide. Worldwide. No. Painful. Painful. That's what I'm talking about. So not big. I'm talking about like acute. I'm talking about painful. Oh, wow. Right. Painful. A few. Let me give you an example. Let me give you an example. You're sitting on your couch, yeah. and you say, man, I'm watching Succession on HBO. By the way, who watches Succession? It is epic, right? So I'm watching it, right? Season three, oh, season, I mean, uh, yeah, season three, yeah, season three thing. Two, no, two, damn, two. Okay, so two, so I'm watching, I promise I watch it. So I'm watching it, <laughs> and I'm hungry, so, I'm, like, I'm watching TV. I'm hungry. What do I need? I need somebody to deliver food for me. Yes. Right? That's a problem of what? Uh, need. Need. Convenience. Yeah. Comfort. Is that acute? Is that yes. painful? No. no, I can take my lazy butt off, off the chair, yeah. get into my car, put my keys, and drive like we used to do it. <laughs> Y'all remember how we used to do it. This is the other thing too that's like, I go back. I remember when I was sitting and, time to change the channel. Oh yeah, that's true, you can sit there and wait. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Thing that had all the little numbers, but we, oh yeah, taking it back. Oh, no. oh hold on real quick. Get the antenna. Oh, get the antenna right. Okay. Make sure the cable that you're stealing from the neighbor is good. Yep, that's exactly how we did it. Exactly how we did it. But I remember that, right? You remember that. But now it's like, oh, convenience. All right. But is that acute? No, it's not acute. Let me tell you what acute is. Erectile dysfunction. Yeah. 
now? As I stand up. So here's the thing. I'm serious. I'm serious. Now I'm saying, I don't suffer from this. However, however, there are three million men that suffer from erectile dysfunction. Do you know what men had to do before Viagra came in? You know what they had to do? Ice. No. Ice. 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 Jamaica sea moss. There's your sea moss. I'm gonna tell you what men had to do before Viagra came out. They still had pills, but the difference is that the pills you took, it would take eight to ten hours before you got an erection. And I was sitting there thinking, I was sitting, like, I'm a married man. I can't even predict eight to ten hours before I'm about to have sex. Think about that. It's like, hmm. I think tomorrow at 12 o'clock I'm going to have sex. Let me pop this pill real quick. Right? Think about that for a second. No, no, no. That, that was actually a thing. Is that a problem? Yes. Fellas, is that a problem? Yes. They even raised their hand. They just said, yes. that's a problem. So now, Viagra comes to market. And guess what? You could pop a pill. And in less than 30 minutes, you're good. 10 hours? 10 hours, 30 minutes. That's crazy. And that's the reason why Viagra is one of the most profitable pharmaceutical pills that there is ever, ever is landed on the market. Ever landed on the market. That's acute. See what I mean? That's acute. It's also massive. No question. No, I'm joking. And it wasn't designed for that. That's true. Oh, it was. That's true. It was designed for. You remember? Uh, blood pressure. The blood pressure. Absolutely. And it was a side effect. It was a side effect. Yes. It's, 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 it's uh, first of all a lot. To your point, a lot of products are that we that you, that, as you say acute issues are derived from things that have already been identified, produced for something else, and are repurposed. Yes, yeah. yes, absolutely, absolutely. So there you have acute. So we're all with each other, right? Yeah. We know what acute is, Yeah. okay? The second is that you must have skills. Yes. And experience yes. that allows you to create a unique solution to the acute problem. That's what entrepreneurship is in my mind. Entrepreneurship is creating solutions for problems. If you want to be a micro niche entrepreneur, you have to create a unique solution to what? An acute problem. An acute problem, okay? So what allows you to have a unique skill set and experience? That depends. It depends, but what the beauty is, is if you can distinguish yourself from the rest of the folks in your space. For example, when I launched my matchmaking business, what I noticed was that I went to a conference, there were 250 of the top matchmakers in the world. There was not one man in the room. And at that time, there were less than five male matchmakers in the world who were full time. Automatically, I said, oh my God, if I enter the space, I have a unique perspective. There was no one that was my age. Everyone was older. I thought, oh my God, I've got a unique perspective. There was no one who was black. I said, I got a unique perspective. <laughs> Y'all know that I got a unique perspective on life, all right, that you can't replicate. So, boom, I had a unique perspective. But at the same time, I was missing all the social sciences, the psychology, social psychology. So I realized I had to go back to school, pick up the social psychology side, the social sciences side, in order to position myself to have the right skills and experience. And guess what? When I went back, I started coming up with more unique ideas to the acute problem. This is where you have to be self-aware. And this is a place where you almost have to stop and say, do I have the ability to do this? Do I have the ability to go after those skills? Because if I don't, maybe this is a good idea for me to provide to someone else, right? So that's number two. Number three, let's talk about, I'll talk about contestability, okay? Now, what are ways
to prevent people from coming into your space. It could be like Viagra, where you patent what you do. It could be like an investment I made this year. My biggest investment this year is in a coffee bean seedling nursery in Blue Mountain, Jamaica. Coffee bean seedling nursery. There are three seedling nurseries in Jamaica. Grow the seedling and then sell the seedling to the 6,000 coffee bean farmers in Jamaica. This is a micro niche, micro niche space. Do you know what our contestability is with that business? The land. The land. Geographically, we own land in Jamaica that you just can't replicate. God created that. You can't replicate that unless you're Elon Musk. <laughs> but you can't. So there's geography. But then there's another way. What I did with my matchmaking business. There's you could protect it through marketing. When I launched my matchmaking space, I specifically focused on black women who were professional, lots of other characteristics. At that time, all of the content was being served up by three sources for the most part. Essence Magazine, BET, and Black Enterprise to a certain extent. So what I did is I went and I partnered with each of those entities and, in, and basically created barriers to entry by partnering with those entities, which meant that if you wanted to come into the space, you had to partner with one of those if you wanted to get mass distribution. And guess what? Paul was partnered with them. So they're going to tell you no thank you. All right? So being able to protect your contestability. So the question there is, is, do you have the ability to protect the contestability of your market? If you do, micro niche might be good for you. All right? Might be good for you. Next up. This is what I found to be interesting about my first business, is basically, is your brand believable yeah. for the space? Is your brand believable in the space? The reason why I say this is so important is because I'm telling you, folks, I don't care how great your product is, especially when you're in a micro niche, people are not buying your product. They're buying you. That's true. Yeah. They're buying you, right? So when I launched one of my first businesses, it was a complete disaster. Right out of investment banking, <laughs> yeah. right out of investment banking, I launched with my then girlfriend, who's now become my wife, what we, what we called at that time the pet and animal buyer. Then we flipped it to Animal Spot, which we designed software for animal shelters. We did innovate something. So if you have, who has a pet? Okay, have you ever received a mailer, like from IAMS or some pet food manufacturer, right? Yeah, we started that. So. Back in the day, what we would do is we would give the animal shelters the software for free in exchange for the data, right? We would take that data and we would sell it to the pet food manufacturer. So that way, if your poodle had arthritis, we know to sell it to a certain uh, pharmaceutical company and they'll then try to upsell you on their, on their drugs, right? That's what we did. Now, great business, but I wasn't believable as, as a brand. Do you know why? First of all, that was back in the day when I liked my suits, <laughs> right? And I have a Rolex, but I sure enough had a nice fake Rolex that looked like the real thing, right? <laughs> so I liked, I liked, I had a, like, I had this nice suit look, right? Yeah, now imagine me walking into a rural Virginia animal <laughs> shelter. <laughs> What's up? How you doing? Right? Right, right? I wasn't believable. I just wasn't believable. You know how many pets I had? No. Zero. None. I don't like the fur on my suits. <laughs> You're right about that. It's funny. Yeah. And guess what? It was a miserable, fail. great idea, miserable failure. Why? People didn't buy into me. Right. They have to be able to buy into you. Are you believable as a steward of your brand in that micro niche? Yes. And last, and then we'll get into some questions. Last, and this is one of my favorites because this is counter to what a lot of people teach in business, is that you always hear that, oh, before you launch your business, you have to have, have, to have enough capital to last you three years. You have to have enough capital, like enough runway to be able to last you five years. Or, hey, oh, I can't hear you. Yeah. 
Yeah. <laughs> right? But the real question is, is, do you have enough capital to get you through product market fit? Do you have enough capital to get you through product market fit? This is the challenge with the micro niche because it's all about product market fit. Now, I've just said product market fit five times. What the hell is product market fit? That's what I was saying. <laughs> <laughs> What's product market fit? Somebody tell me. Whether people want your product. Yes, ma'am. Attracting the specific market that's going to be able to use your solution. Okay, I like it. We're there. It's like we're going to Jamaica. <laughs> but we just stopped in Miami. <laughs> no, no, no. We're going to Jamaica. Come on, we're close. It's hot. It's good. There's lots of Jamaicans in Miami. But give me to Kingston. So give me more. They have the exact pain point. Like you're, you, have, you have to be able to have enough capital to feel through kind of the weeds to get to the client that has the exact pain point that's going to pay the premium price with the profitability. Okay, okay, we're in Haiti. <laughs> we're in Haiti. It's so hot right now. It's so hot in Haiti. Give me, give me to Kingston. They're your people. <laughs> they're your people. Okay, how do, how, do, how do we know they're your people? How do we know that it fits? That's product market fit. How do we know? Because they're not just buying, but they're also referring. Because your people know people that are your people. They're okay. Your colleagues, they're sitting in rooms like this. So okay. All right. I like it. We're, guess what? Yeah, yeah. We're not to Kingston. We're in Montego Bank. Now. We're in Jamaica. <laughs> <laughs> We're in Jamaica. Okay. You're close. Just real quick. I don't know. I don't know. Okay. <laughs> what, com what comes to mind is whoever is supporting you, whatever that face is. Whenever they have a question, like let's say um, you see you have the, the shoes, well, I didn't like this, I like this style, you're able to be accommodate and able to fix to your client. So you're able to be fit in that sense that you're able to be flexible, scale back, bring, bring other things, to add things to the table, <coughs> take things out that you don't need, you know, and be able to um, be conducive along with your clients or your supporters so that they're able to be more satisfied with the product that you're giving out and hence they're able to use it because you're not going to use a pencil that doesn't work. Right. I he so here's the so I hear you. What if you're the I, 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 I hear you. Let me, well, I'll tell you what. Let me hear from, from you, young lady, and then we'll... Then we'll How about if your first paycheck, the first time you receive cash from them? Okay, the first time you receive cash. Paying customers. Oh my gosh. Paying customers. Paying customers. Who likes money? We talked about this. I know you like money. Every time I said money, she's like, right here. I like money, bro. Right. The check, right. So here, here's the thing. Product market fit, ultimately, it's about that check. It's about who writes over, who writes the check to you. But you can distinguish product market fit before that because all money is not good money. Yeah. Let me give you an example. I'll give you two quick examples and we'll open up the, the floor for questions. One. Dropbox, Drew Houston. Everybody knows about Dropbox, right? Yeah. Dropbox, billion dollar company. Do you know what his MVP, what's an MVP? Minimum viable. Minimum viable product. Minimum viable product, right? Here we go, star student. Minimum viable product. That is what gets you to product market fit. So what you're doing when you're launching your business is all you're doing is you're creating a product that you have spent the least amount of effort that will give you the identification of product market fit. So sometimes that's not going to be a check. Let me give you the Drew Houston example. When he was building Dropbox, he said, I need to see if the market wants this. How do I determine if the market wants this? What did he do at that time? He built a screenshot, basically. One page of this is what Dropbox will look like. Right? This is what I'm doing with Dropbox. He didn't code anything. This is what it's going to look like. Mm -hmm. And then he put it up on, at that time, it was, um, uh, what was this Reddit? What was hot back then? Dig, uh, was, Dig. Dig, was Dig, there you go, Dig, it was Dig. It was Dig and Reddit. He threw it on Dig and Reddit, and you know what he said? He said, I'm getting ready to launch Dropbox. <clears throat> Drop your email here, 
if you're interested in being the first to get the release. Oh. Within 24 hours, he had over 5,000 emails. Wow. Is that a strong indicator that the product, that the market wants the product? Yeah. Yeah. All right. When I decided five years ago, I'd run these masterminds. Five years ago, I said, let me put out something. So before I had even launched the mastermind, I put one Google page together, right? Uh -huh. it took me 15 minutes and said, this is something I think I'm gonna do. I put it on Facebook. Overnight, 220 applicants. Before I had, had even created it. Does that indicate product market fit? <clears throat> Absolutely. So what you wanna do is you, as a micro entrepreneur, is you wanna figure out what is that MVP that you can test. You wanna put that in the marketplace, and guess what? 90% likelihood, you're not gonna get product market fit right out the gate. So what does that mean? That means that you take the information that you're getting, and then you tweak it a little bit, you pivot a little bit, and then you put it back out into the marketplace. You see if you get product market fit. Do I have product market fit? Not yet. Let me take the information, put it back, pivot a little bit. This is the process. And what I am saying is that you continue that process until you get product market fit. Once you get product market fit, you have a business. Mm -hmm. Now, you need to have enough money to get you to product market fit. Yeah. Because if you could get to product market fit, my commitment to you is you can get the money. You can go rob somebody, no. You can, <laughs> you, there's lots of places to get money once you have product market fit. You can fund it off of the product itself, you can get, you could do group funding, crowdsource funding, there's factors, there's all kinds of things. But you wanna be able to get the product market fit. That's the key, all right? That's how you enter a niche successfully, that's how you defend against it. Questions? I, it sounds to me like what you've been saying is really talking about the importance of testing. Yeah. When, you, when, you, so when you're talking about product market, <coughs> you're probably talking about testing, which is what I think you're talking about, which is what I think this all leads to, is the relevance and the importance of having enough capital to test whatever product you're going to put out there to see if it's going to be viable. Is that correct? Yes, yes. So to answer, yes. But also what I, hopefully I'm conveying is that you don't necessarily need massive capital to get to product market fit. As I sat down on Google Docs for less than 30 minutes and then hit posts on Facebook, right. that was all the effort. Minimum viable product, the least amount of effort that you put towards a product that can confirm product market fit. That's literally what the definition is, according to Lean Startup, right? Eric Reese wrote Lean Startup, which is a great book, by the way. Yeah, great book. <coughs> Other questions? Yes, ma'am. Um, so when you're doing um, a viable product, um, how important is your target audience? Like, you know, using your example, you were saying you put it on Facebook or even the Dropbox guy, he put it there. Like, what were you or him specific in your target audience for that specific product or yeah. service? This is a brilliant question. Brilliant question. Okay, so in the marketplace, you have a market. You have segmentation of the market. Mm -hmm. There's what's called an MVS, business terms. MVS, minimum viable segment. So that's the group within the group, within the group, within the group that you believe is not only the target, they share the pain, they share the, the, the acute pain, but there's also enough of those people to sustain a business. Because the downside, and we didn't get into this, of a micro niche, is that there's simply just not enough buyers for what you want to provide, yeah. right? I can say, you know, here's the thing. I want to get in the business of selling this. You know what this is? A flyer with Paul's face on it. Now, are there enough people in the world to sustain me paying my mortgage with this product? Maybe in London, but not here. Okay, so 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 it's not going to work. So the so the segmentation is not big enough. So you want to be able to uh, to to identify a minimum viable segment, so as small as possible, but big enough to be able to support the product, and then you specifically take your MVP and you drop it there. Drew Houston went to dig and read it. Why? Because that's where all the techno dudes were on, right? So that's where I, why he did it there versus why he did it on the BET website, you know? Questions? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, um, I'd like to know, for instance, a product um, that's successful overseas and you're introducing it to the U.S. market. For example, the Guayaquil brand, the Yerba Mate, which is 
and just drink it. It's a ready-made beverage. Okay. Would you think of that, or let's talk about hibiscus or something like that. Would you think about that as a niche market? Because there, um, like, people don't even know about it. You're just bringing in something new to the market. Or is that in a completely different analysis that goes along with that? Yeah, that's slightly different. That is akin to what's called blue ocean, a blue ocean. And a blue ocean is a business strategy which says, you know what, this is a massive space and there's no one in it yet. How do I know it's a massive space? Because in 10 other countries, it's being consumed widely, right? Which means when you introduce it here, it's going to become a massive space here. So it won't be a micro niche. Micro niche is like <coughs> my matchmaking business where I specifically focus on a clientele, or actually, let me give you another example for micro niche. Patty Stinger, anybody know Patty Stinger? The millionaire matchmaker, like literally, right? Her business was she focused on wealthy men, men who made at least a million dollars every year, lived in three cities, and that was all she focused on. That niche, or that marketplace, maybe the maximum opportunity of that was $20 million which is small in terms of a market. That's all it was. There was no overseas, there was no, it was just that. That's a micro niche. See what I mean? Okay. Any questions? Yes, ma'am. Um, so when you started the matchmaking business, obviously that wasn't your specialty at that point, maybe, because you had other businesses as well. How did you identify that industry that you wanted to focus on? Okay, so that was part of the, this is the second where I was talking about you have to have uh, unique skills. So for me, the real quick story is that I, at that time, I was in education. And I was working on a project where I saw that the kids in this group were not, um, well, one person made, brought it to my attention that the, that the kids in this group didn't have two parents in the household. So I became obsessed. I went through this rabbit hole of, why don't they have two parents? What's the percentage of, of kids that have two parents? Oh, this is what the divorce rate is. Oh, this is what the single population is. So I went through this rabbit hole. And then it landed me at that matchmaking co matchmaker conference. And it was at the conference where I sat in the back of the room because I was late, because I'm late everywhere. By the way, I was right on time today. Yeah. <laughs> it wasn't late. Um, but I sat in the back of the room and I began to realize the differences that I had with the group but yet the inherent interest and passion I had on the topic. So it was putting myself in that, in that environment to see I have a unique POV. And one thing that I want you to walk away with is that I promise you, your uniqueness is your power. Where you are unique is actually what makes you great. Wow. And what we end up trying to do is we end up trying to form fit, especially with social media. Yes. Everybody sees, oh, this Instagram post is getting me money, he's getting me likes, I'm gonna do this Instagram post, right? We're all about copycat. Instead, what you wanna do is you wanna look at industries that you have a natural passion around and look at what makes you different and through that difference, how you can create unique solutions for that particular you know, area. Make sense? Okay, yes sir. I've, I've, I've had many business plans throughout my, uh, you know, uh, I want to say I'm a teacher like, like you were in the past. But my question is like, everybody says you got to start off small. All right? And I have a, you know, I want to go back to the food industry. I, want, I, have, a, I have a unique idea about uh, a fast food joint that's not over here or not anywhere in the world. So I want to I want to enter. I want to enter this industry, yet I don't have any money. So would you recommend like starting off the food cart or, or, or you know risking that house and going you know going in there full steam so you know the contestability you know because if I open up that if I get that food cart going then someone's gonna go and open up that restaurant right I hear you this is this is a great question for everybody right because I think we all if you want if you're here it means you probably have an idea that you think is going to be big. Right, otherwise you wouldn't want to be here. That's how we get to the money, right? So this is a brilliant question. And a lot of us are thinking, at what level do I get in? Do I just risk it all? Yeah. No, don't do that. <laughs> He's like, I'm about to gamble it all right now. Don't quit my day job. Don't quit your day job, right? Instead, let me actually test the room to see how well you're listening. What did I say already 
that this gentleman needs to do? Test the market. Test the market. How can he test the market? Okay, how he could he? Have, no, 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 he could have just cooked whatever is special, brought it here today, and we could have told him. Uh, no. You know what, though? You know, can I, wait, oh, one second. This is what I'm talking about. How much effort, how much effort is in that? Very little. Now, let's go with this, because this is brilliant. If he brought it in, he brought in whatever it was, and he set it out actually there. Yeah. You don't steal my idea, be No! No! No, no. Hold on, hold on for a second. Hold on, hold on. You are bringing up a lot of great stuff. All right, hold on. I want to keep through this. You are brilliant. Thank you for being here, by the way. And he puts it in here. Yeah. Then... What is he then observing? What is, what is he looking for for product market fit? Response. 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 What kind of response? Is it good? How does he know it's good? Because he's not surveying. So how does he know? Exactly. People are like, Paul, you're really good. But that over there, hold on for a second. Right? It's if you, if you're eating it all up, right? You see people with that, whatever, it's like a sauce. People are like, so, oh. that's how you know. No, here, now, hold on for a second. Let's talk, let's talk about that in a second, okay? But that's product market fit. That's what I'm talking about. That takes you little effort to get, to get the reaction, especially if you want to launch it here. We all live in D.C. And look how diverse this room is. Why don't you do that? Go home, go home, come back. All right, come back. Now, to your question about trust, this is also a big one. A lot of entrepreneurs are like, oh man, I want to launch this. Everybody's going to steal my stuff. You know how I respond to that? I'm sorry? I, I said it? No, the truth is that, that whether, they, whether they steal it today or tomorrow doesn't matter. The reality is they won't. But look at how many burger places, look at how many, right. there's so many they're, different. You said look how many burger places, they're saying that you're not. Because well, there, there, there's an experience that you provide. Exactly. Right. There's, 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 there's a direct right experience. Yes, yes. Yeah. Okay, so now, so now, here's here's my answer. My answer is a combination of all of these. First, to the point of they're not going to steal your idea. Remember, everybody from my business school went where? They went up there. Yeah. I went down here. Those folks up here, they're not even looking down. They're not even looking, and actually their stomachs are so big they can't even see them. <laughs> they can't even see their feet, okay? So here's the thing. You think I'm entering a space, whatever. I'm telling you, they could care less. Yeah. Micro niches, they could care less. My matchmaking business operated in a niche mm -hmm. that Match.com, which is mm. the biggest company in the dating space, still hasn't gone into. That's right. Wow. They still haven't gone into it. Right? They, first of all, the big boys and girls, they don't care. Secondly, what was the second point I gave on how to determine if you should enter a niche? You have what? Skills and experience. Not just skills and experience, you have unique skills and experience. So my question is, is what do you bring that's unique? Yeah. Yeah. Because if you bring something that's unique, that means you bring something they don't have. And this is where we have to be confident. Yeah. If you bring something to the table that no one has, that may, means you are powerful. Yeah. I'm going. So, but this, this, this is charge. This is real. This is real. What I've noticed about the best, the best entrepreneurs, so I, I'm also a business columnist. I'm Jamaican, I got 10 jobs, right? So I'm, I'm a business columnist for USA Today. I have interviewed more billionaires than any other journalist, any other journalist. And one thing that I've recognized about these, these, these billionaires is that there's a level of presence that is just, you just, you just can't compete with. And the reason why they have the presence is it's not arrogance, it's supreme confidence in who they are. Ooh. And that carries through to relationships. Yes. We can talk about that in a second. Yes. How many folks are single in the room, just real quick? 
have that and you have that 